Welcome to Sarder TV, an idea sharing platform founded by Russell Sarder, who's an author, investor, and the CEO of Netcom Learning. We're excited to have Tacey Trowbridge join us today. Tacey is the lead for education, thought, leadership, and advocacy at Adobe, and she's here to tell us more about trends in the fields of learning and development. Tacey, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to have you here. Oh, it's such an honor. I'm really thrilled to have a chance to talk with you and be part of the, the program. So start off by telling us a little bit about your career and your background and how you got to Adobe. Well, it's a long story. I started um, really with a passion for learning. I was teaching swimming in the summers, and I loved that moment when a student could do something they didn't think they could do, when they then had the confidence to swim across the pool, and I thought, this is it. I want to keep helping people gain confidence, gain skills, gain abilities that they didn't know they could gain. I became a classroom teacher for a number of years, and then got interested in the ways in which technology could really support and enhance teaching and learning. We did technology work in schools for a while and then went to Stanford to learn more about what is the research saying. I'd seen plenty of things that worked well and some things that didn't work so well. And the stakes are high in education. If you invest in technology, boy, it better be worth it. You're also working with students where this is their one shot at third grade. <laughs> so the, anything that you're teaching really needs to be worthwhile. So at Stanford, I entered a program in the School of Education that focused on learning design and technology and the intersection of those three fields. That was fascinating to me. I've been an educator and I didn't realize, oh, I'm also an instructional designer. <laughs> um, and learning how to speak across the, to an audience that's, that comes from a tech background, be able to focus on the central question of what's the learning? How are we helping impact learning, leveraging the fields of technology of education and design? I worked for an ed tech startup for a while, made my way to the UC system and worked on some really exciting projects there. And when an opportunity came up at Adobe to focus on this intersection of learning design and technology, it was a great fit for me and a really exciting place to take some of the ideas that I'd been working on at a nationwide level or within the state of California to a global level and engage with educators and students around the world. Yeah, that's amazing. What are some of the biggest trends that you've seen um, starting from you know when you start to do your research to, to what it's like today? Yeah, interesting. So some of the work that I was um, focused on was around how to build community online. And that seems like when I was doing that work in grad school, that was so long ago. And we've all been asking these questions about how do we build community online when we've been sheltering in place, we've been in and out of the workplace. And so this idea of online community building and connection, I think is one that's really important and continues to be of interest. Another area that I focused on was around uh, technology technology as a persuasive tool for learning or for good. So how can we help people say change a habit, uh, do engage in learning something new that, that they're interested in but not quite sure how to get started? How can technology help do that? And so the question about modality, the kinds of things that humans need as they're learning and then how to design learning, those are things I've been interested in my whole career and I feel like they have just come to the fore as we've been navigating our way through a global pandemic. So tell us a little bit about your role as the lead for education, thought leadership and advocacy at Adobe. Yeah, a part of what we do is we focus on research. We want to know what are the essential skills for students as they go into the workforce. It's probably no surprise that what we're seeing is that these essential skills are things like communication, collaboration, critical thinking, creative problem solving. Uh, so we, as we look at those skills and whether or not they're taught in school, part of what we're trying to do is understand the best ways in which educators can help prepare students for a rapidly changing world where these kinds of essential skills and the, and the skill of being a lifelong learner is going to be one that really matters to students. So part of the role is around research. Then we also look at uh, ways in which we can give educators platforms to share their stories, to share examples. I think one of the great ways in which people learn is by seeing a model, by hearing what somebody else has done, and not just a model that's perfect, but a model where of someone who's struggled to learn something new, to figure out the best way to engage a particular audience. And so part of the work that we do is around trying to, to elevate the stories of educators and make sure that they're heard broadly by policymakers, by other educators, by parents. 
then we also advocate for the kind of instructional practices that really have delivered the best results in terms of preparing folks with these essential skills. I've also been focused on how to help students demonstrate skills, whether that's in the college admissions process, through a portfolio, through certification. And then we work on just exploring new ways to engage learners. And I started a podcast this year focused on kind of creating curriculum and professional development for educators, ways in which we can use live streaming and conferences to help reach and engage an audience. So some of it is around the foundational, what are we doing and why? And some of it is on outreach. How do we help share what we're learning with others? How does all this benefit Adobe as an organization? That's a great question. So in two ways, one is that Adobe is always seeking to hire. And so we're looking for a generation that's ready, that comes to work with the ability to innovate, to help us peek around the corner and create the future. So we need employees with these kinds of skills. And that's part of the work. Part of it is also that our clients need these kinds of skills as well. Our customers are looking to hire broadly folks who are effective communicators, who can communicate visually, who can communicate through video. It also, education is a huge focus for Adobe. Uh, We believe everyone has a story to tell and want to empower people to do that. Part of the way in which we ensure that everyone gets that opportunity is through education and through providing the kinds of experiences to students that really help them be successful. And then finally, educational institutions are very much interested in these questions as well. If we can help them to figure out the right ways to share a program, and that may be by sharing someone else's stories, but if we can help educators really understand how to prepare students for the future, then we're helping uh, prepare that next generation. So you mentioned a podcast, that you started a podcast. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, the uh, Creative Educator podcast has been a labor of love. It's been a, a real opportunity to engage with thought leaders, with folks who are doing interesting work, sometimes reporters, sometimes educators, but to hear from them about the issues of today. We started it during the pandemic. <laughs> So began by hearing from Richard Collada at ISTE, who was, has such an interesting global perspective. And I've loved the kinds of conversations that we've had and the ability to reflect on the change that's happened this year and to think about what the future looks like. It's also been a key place where I've been learning. And I think for me to take on a new project and figure out how to record from my home. <laughs> do You're a professional journalist, but this is I've been learning how to guide a conversation and figure out how to ask the right kinds of questions. So it's been a super exciting project to work on this year and one where I've learned a lot. Tell us about who some of your guests have been. You know, what are some of the topics that you've talked about? Yeah. Well, one of our guests was Rebecca Hare, who's a teacher. She's a former designer, but got really interested in how to help design classrooms to support creativity, whether they're virtual classrooms or physical classrooms. And she's got some really fascinating ways in which she can help anybody, regardless of their budget, to make a space more creative and more engaging for the right kinds of learning. I also uh, spoke with Uh, Well, I mentioned Richard, he's fabulous, and certainly think he's done really amazing work in education. But then also with Jeff Salingo, he's a really fabulous journalist, worked at the Chronicle of Higher Education for many years, and has been writing some really fascinating books about essential skills. What are the skills that college students need when they leave school? And then he wrote about the admissions process most recently, which is such a fascinating um, process and important because it really sends strong signals to education about what should be taught. And so his research of following different institutions to understand how they made decisions and essentially a call for really rethinking this process and making it one that's more visible. He was a fabulous guest as well. So tell us a little bit about your thoughts on how the pandemic has changed the landscape of learning and development in organizations. I think it's been such a fascinating time where we've really had to stop what we're doing and think about purpose. What are we trying to do? Because we have to do it in a different way. We can't do things the way we've always done them. And so this this moment to really pause and investigate is we've been doing this forever, but is this the best way to do it? Is it the right way to do it? Is it really solving the problems that we're trying to solve? And so I think that moment to pause has been incredibly important. Partnered with that is the challenge to act, (laughs) to figure out quickly how do you adapt in a changing world. 
And I think we all had permission to innovate and not just permission, but a call to innovate. We had to figure out how to do things differently and still accomplish the broad goals, the broad things that we were working on. It forced us to look at media differently and think about the ways in which we communicate. I think the, the, for me, the podcast was interesting. We all spent so much time on video calls or in learning and video in the classroom to just have audio as the format was really appealing. And I think for me, it was at least a rest from some of the ongoing Zoom. I think then organizations also had to think about how to engage people with grace. This was a time that's been really challenging for all sorts of people. So the kinds of expectations that we had needed to shift and adapt based on what was happening for individuals. I was suddenly working in the same place where we were also teaching second grade. (laughs) So that changed what was possible for me. Everyone faced different kinds of challenges, but important ones. So I think this need for grace was part of what I saw as being an important trend. And then finally, I think really thinking through the right ways in which we can engage and experimenting around that for learning. So as we were working with educators, we knew that they sometimes needed community. They needed to connect with other educators and to do that in ways that were at a reasonable scale where you could really get to know someone and engage with them. So a smaller learning community. We also saw that people needed to be able to do things on their own time. So asynchronous learning became incredibly important, that our time really was different. Uh, Certainly my time was different with second grade at home, but I know that was true for many people where we had to, we had to do, we had to work and learn in the times that we had available. And then I think the topics shifted as well. We changed our focus for the Adobe Education Exchange to really highlight distance learning. How can we help educators who overnight had to learn how to teach differently through an entirely different format? And so we focused on both elevating the stories of folks who've been doing this for years by being to show starting points and beginning places with sample lessons, with ideas of ways in which you could engage with students. So I think that the implications are huge in terms of what's happened last year. What I'm really excited about is what do we take with us? Where are we going? I think the goal is not to go back to the way things were, but to take forward some of what we've learned. So what would you say are some of those key learnings from the past year based on everything that you just mentioned? Yeah, I think there's there's a piece around assessment in education that we can do assessment differently. And that is we're looking at what's really meaningful and matters to students. The systems had to shut down. We couldn't do standardized testing in the same way. And so we had to look for alternatives. That doesn't mean standardized testing should go away, but it probably shouldn't be the only way in which we're giving students feedback and helping them learn and see their progress and growth. I think there are also some interesting questions around when we need to be in person and when we don't, that we've often defaulted to in person being the best. One of the things that stood out for me during the pandemic is that some people actually did better in when they were able to focus, when they were able to have more quiet, when they were able to learn at their own pace and at their own time. And so I think there are questions that we need to continue to investigate about the best modalities for learning and to be broad in the ways in which we think about that. I hope also some of the issues that were really highlighted around equity are things that we carry forward as well. That there were certainly things in education that were long-standing challenges, but the pandemic brought them into really stark relief. Some of what I hope we take with us is a recognition of what we've learned in this past year, a recognition of some of the things that we need to change, and the sense of not just permission, but a call to really do things differently, to to do them differently in a way that better serves all of us and that better serves our goals and our needs. Do you feel like you're starting to see that a little bit more in the discussion, in the way things are being talked about and executed a little bit? more? I hope so. And I think there's a there's a risk of just being tired and wanting to relax back into the way we had done things previously. So I think it's a call for leaders to be able to, to continue to nurture those conversations, to continue to have an eye set on the big picture of where we're going. It's also a call for individuals to reflect on what they've learned and share that. As I think about particularly in the education space, A lot of the news lately has been focused on this question of where do we go from here? It matters to hear from the leaders, from the Secretary of Education, from folks who are shaping education policy, but it also matters to hear from the educators 
who had very specific experiences and important learnings this year. So I'm hopeful as we go forward that we will carry things with us. But I think it's going to take a lot of work to uh, continue to, to maintain that focus and that sense of urgency around this work. I think a similar conversation is also happening around how organizations are going to be handling similar situations. What's been your experience so far as an employee? Within, within Adobe? Yeah very quick to make decisions about with prioritizing its employees and communicated that clearly. So I think that sense that Adobe was being thoughtful about how to engage and keep employees safe and provide the right kind of support and grace as needed. That was an, an important piece right away. I think then we focused on how do we help people be successful learning from home? What are the ways, what are the things people need to set up an office in their house, which they haven't done before? <laughs> Um, how do we ensure that the work schedules work, function in the right kinds of ways, that parents are supported, that if someone has a family member who's ill, that they're also supported during this time? And I think there were lots of learnings for the organization about how well we were able to keep going in terms of developing software, delivering product that we needed to deliver, ensuring that we pivoted to support our customers that were also challenged to figure out how do we communicate how do we ensure that our voices are heard in a really noisy space? How do we continue to innovate and adapt so that we can measure the impact of our work? And so I, I think that some of what I've seen Adobe do is about internal customers. It's also uh, internal customers. Some of, some of what I've been really impressed that Adobe's done is support employees, but also our customers in figuring out how to change and adapt uh, in a world that is moving so quickly around us and requires us to think differently. And how do you think organizations have done in keeping up with this? Because there has been such a rapid change yeah. in how, how we're working, how we're delivering, what we're doing as employees, what are some of the challenges that organizations have faced in keeping up with training their employees around this, making sure that they're aware of what they need to do to get sort of the job done in a very yeah. changing time? Well, I think like all of the segments in the economy that, that things changed completely and we had to reinvent that. So figuring out how to support employee, employees learning meant we had to go back and start again <laughs> and figure out how do we reach people? What are the kinds of things that they need right now? The topics changed. So focusing on how do you run a meeting or manage a, a, a team that's remote? How do you ensure that you're really taking care of the needs of your employees and your customers? Then there was a lot of newness of figuring out how to be on a video conference all day and be able to really work well in that kind of setting. Uh, what I think it also reflected in the ways in which we set goals and the kind of work that people were doing. We reprioritized everything after March of 2020. What's the work that really needs to happen? What's the work that we could put on a slow roll that we can pick up and come back to? And so I think some of those efforts are things that I hope help us in the long term in terms of thinking about prioritization. How do we measure the impact of our work? How do we pivot quickly uh, as circumstances change? In this case, the pandemic changed quite a lot. But as we look forward, we expect to see ongoing change in the kinds of technologies that people use, the problems that we have to solve. So to be to have companies have to have had this experience of learning to be more nimble organizations, more focused on really the essential skills, and then rolling up our sleeves and innovating and figuring out how do we do this? We've never done this before. Lots of trial and error, lots of innovation, room to fail, but ultimately the learnings are what matter. Tell us about some of the best practices around building a learning culture in, in any organization. Well, I think one important piece is empathy, is knowing who your learners are and how to help address their specific needs. And so I think that's a place that's really critical to spend time. It's just understanding your learners, their goals, and how to best engage them. I think then treating learning as something that is ongoing, that's lifelong, setting expectations that employees are continuing to learn and grow is a critical part of this as well in designing a program. 
And then I think creating multiple entry points and places for people to learn throughout their career, but also to learn throughout their day, to learn um, in the course of a year. So there's a part that's connected to performance and tying expectations for performance to learning and to continued growth. I think then organizations also need to provide room for people to experiment and to try. And that means sometimes you don't succeed, but to be able to continue to learn from what you're doing. As I've been working on learning for my career, the, the best way to learn is actually to do something. So it's not so much going to a class, although that can be an important component, but it's actually rolling up your sleeves and really trying something. A critical part of that is the role of the manager in giving feedback what worked and what didn't work, and feedback that's about growth. That's not about punishment, but is really about, here's where we want you to go. And so I think that making sure you understand your learners, making sure that you're providing the right kinds of opportunities and an expectation for learning, and then providing the right kind of support for learning are things I see as really key best practices. What role do you play in helping, you know, the educators you work with, the students you work with, really keep up that type of learning culture. Adobe's work to support educators in learning is designed to make it easy for educators to stay current in the kinds of tools that they can use that might be most effective in their classrooms. Uh, it's challenging as the world moves so quickly, and so we want to make that easy for educators. We also look to provide free curriculum for educators that helps them engage their students through project-based learning in teaching these really essential skills. Then we also want to ensure that we inspire learning. And so we showcase best practices and examples of really effective teaching and learning. And then finally, we want to celebrate students as they're demonstrating what they've learned. And they're demonstrating this not just to their teacher, but they may be working on a project where there's a real world implication. They're solving a problem that hasn't been solved before, and they're working with experts to do that. They also ultimately are leaving school and going out into the world and need to demonstrate who they are, what they know and can do, and showing showing that kind of knowledge and, and uh, skill can be really challenging. Resumes are a really narrow way to demonstrate that. So is a college application. And so helping students understand that the skills that matter are their communication skills, their collaboration skills, their creativity, and being able to then demonstrate those uh, to a potential employer, to the next step in higher education, is something we also focus on quite a bit. What kind of free curriculum does Adobe offer to educators? Oh, everything from a lesson plan that would help, say, a science teacher do data visualization to a full-blown curriculum for someone who's interested in a video career and everything in between. Uh, we see everyone as creative. We see the role of creativity and communication being important across the curriculum. So we work to provide resources that for an entry point for a history teacher whose focus is teaching history, but they may also want to have students demonstrate historical learning through an infographic. Uh, we also work with on the cutting edge technology, whether it's a 3D imaging or it's ensuring that where students and, and educators are ready to experiment with AR and VR. So we, the curriculum covers quite a range. It's designed to be easy entry points and opportunities to go deep. What are some of the behaviors that are necessary to build a learning culture, whether that's in person or that's in a remote, in a remote setting? One of the important behaviors is to build a community and to build a, a, a learning community where folks are learning from each other. They're bringing their personal experience and knowledge, particularly for adult learners. So as we're working with educators, they bring a lot to the table. So starting with an assumption that they are also sharing their learning and knowledge as, as they're learning something new. I think another piece is to make learning safe to make sure that people are supported. You start in the right place and give them the right kind of support. I think about um, some of our products like say Photoshop, which is a really powerful professional tool. If you're trying to teach someone from beginning to end how to use this, you haven't created an entry point where it's possible for someone to have success and to, to understand uh, and develop an understanding of the power of a tool like that. So when we work with schools, I've seen second grade teachers do really amazing work with some of our professional level tools because they're focused on a particular task. They're not trying to teach everything. They're trying to help a learner be successful and accomplishing a particular task, a particular gain a particular skill, and then build on that. 
I think for particularly with an education, purpose matters as well. Why are we learning these skills? Why does this matter? What's the impact of it? And it, being able to have learners begin to see the success of their own learning, what they're now able to do that they hadn't been previously, that's where feedback comes in and the opportunity to reflect on learning. It can be so important in terms of deepening learning and then providing avenues for next steps. What would you say are some of the biggest skills gaps that you're seeing today? Yeah, we did it. We recently did a study where we looked at two million resumes and two million job postings to try to get an understanding of what are the what are the skills that are really in demand, and then are they showing up in resumes? What we saw in three quarters of the job postings, they were focused on communication, collaboration, creativity skills. When we looked at the resumes, it was the exact opposite. Only a quarter highlighted those particular skills. Doesn't mean that the folks applying for the jobs didn't have those skills, but they may not have known how to highlight them and indicate that they were important. We hear from the World Economic Forum, from The Economist, from all sorts of different organizations that these essential skills, what we used to call soft skills, are what really matters. We know that CEOs are nervous. An IBM study about CEOs highlighted that, in fact, they're not seeing the kinds of skills that they need in the workplace. And having a workforce that's really ready for change is what keeps them up at night. So I think we see that these are the skills that really matter. They're also really challenging to teach. And they aren't things that you can memorize or you can learn from, if you, that you can demonstrate on a standardized test. They're things that require that you dive in, that you try something, that you work on a problem where there's more than one right answer, or maybe no one has found the answer to it yet. What would you say are some of the biggest advantages and disadvantages of remote learning and remote working? While there were lots of, of advantages to be and discover that we discovered and didn't necessarily know would be true, uh, that you could work uh, globally, that people could all sorts of people could participate and engage. It was easier to pull people together. One of the challenges I found uh, was around generating new ideas and doing that in a group. Uh, I'm used to doing that in person, and I love the opportunity to spend more time that's not just in your one hour, 50 minute meeting, but lets you expand a bit. I think there's something about reading a room and getting feedback. So many educators this year taught to blank Zoom boxes where they couldn't see the people and couldn't, couldn't see their students and how their students were reacting. And so I think that that sense of engagement is really challenging. We worked around that and found, I think, some interesting ways to do that. I saw educators, there's a, um, Stanford had a Zoom call where all of the students in the lecture were up on the wall. And so you could see hundreds of students and actually get a sense of what's happening in the room. But that's not typical. And I think there's there are things I'm really looking forward to. But I wonder if it means we need to be at work physically all the time, or if we discover that the key things, the places where we're starting something new, we're getting to know someone for the first time, we're trying to coach someone on something that's really challenging. Many of those things are easier to do in person, where you can see someone's body language better. You can really get a sense of what they're thinking. There's even just more time to explore. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to going back in person. But I expect that there'll be things that we hold on to from this um, and ways in which we will continue to support learning that's asynchronous, that is available for folks at the time that makes the most sense for them in the modality that makes the most sense for them. But I do think building community, while it's possible to do online, it's harder that sometimes that face to face really matters. How have you seen the progress around building communities since you started, from when you started studying it, researching it, yeah. to, to where it's come today? Well, we have many more tools. When I first started studying it, we were really looking at um, text as the way in which we built community. And so it was communities where people were writing messages to each other. I studied in particular a community, children who had chronic diseases. And so they weren't able to be in their classrooms, they were separated from their families, but they needed to be able to communicate and stay in touch. And they used a variety of different tools to do that and the community was powerful, but it was mostly through text. Video has taken a huge step forward in allowing us to connect with people. And I think about the number of people that I've never met in person, but only met on video, and that those relationships are powerful, that, that 
that it's not that you can't do it. It just requires a different kind of effort. And I think we've really come quite a long way in understanding that. And then this past year where we've all had to learn how to do it means for, that there's not an excuse. We've had to learn that, to do this in order to connect and to experiment in building community and strengthening community online. So tell us some of the things that Adobe is doing to prepare new workers and the new workforce. Yeah, that's been such an interesting thing to do this this year because people haven't been able to come in for an orientation. And so as we've brought in interns or hired new people, we've had to be really thoughtful about how to best engage them. And that's simple things like sending them a care package when they arrive so that they feel connected to Adobe as a community, pairing people with mentors from the very beginning so that they have an advocate and someone they can ask questions to and just a chance to get to know another person. We've asked our interns and our employees, at least on the education team, to share something about themselves as well, to create a, a story that reveals who they are, what they care about, what their passions are outside of work, as well as something of their experience. I watched a video just recently that a, a woman created who was beginning at Adobe, and she included a great picture of her dog and pictures <laughs> climbing and hiking uh, around the world and expressed who she was, as well as her incredible experience and background for the work. That's a really great way for us to get to know her. And then some of what we, what I try to do when someone shares that is to respond back, to say, oh, I love your dog, and here's what I'm, I've got a dog too, <laughs> whatever it is that's a point of connection, and looking for the ways in which to make people real and human in addition to being able to do the work. As we get have gotten people ramped up to start a new role and learn new things, learning's been an important part of that and figuring out the best way to introduce someone to everything from Adobe systems to the particular tasks that they're going to need to be doing. And we've had to be creative around that, sometimes pairing them with someone who's more expert so that they have an opportunity to work on a project together. For me, sometimes that's been just checking in with employees, whether it's through WhatsApp or through a quick text or, or a Slack message, just to, to stay connected. Those are things that have been really important during the pandemic as well. And as we look forward, we're really excited to bring people back into the office, but for now, we still need to keep going and still need to build communities, build relationships and help employees be successful in their roles. What is it that you enjoy most about the work that you do? That's a great question and a hard one because there are lots of great things I get to do. I think one of the things I love is that I have an opportunity to continue to learn. So I hear, I love hearing from educators and students. I can't wait to go back into schools. I've loved being invited into people's Zoom classes to be able to connect. But I feel like that's where I get a lot, I get fed. That's where I get a lot of my knowledge and passion. It keeps me interested and engaged to continue to learn. So that's been a wonderful thing. I think in general, Adobe has a culture that's really focused on creativity and innovation. And I love that challenge. It's one of the things that when I'm hiring, I'm always looking for restless innovators, people who want to keep, they look at the world as it is and then think about how can I make this better? How could we tweak something or wholesale change something in order to improve? And I love working in a culture that supports and champions that sense of creativity, that sense of um, empowerment to be able to make a change, to innovate, to come up with new ideas. So those are some of the things that I, I love about Adobe. I also love having a global role. Uh, that's something that I learn a tremendous amount from. I really appreciate the time spent both in regions and then hearing from educators and from my colleagues around the world, around their challenges, the way in which they're approaching teaching and learning. Uh, it's just a fascinating place to be. What are some of, some of the things that you've learned about um, education, learning, how people learn, in the different regions that you've worked in or from around the world? So one is that we we host um, a learning platform called the Adobe Education Exchange. And it's a place where educators can come and find free professional development and curriculum. It's also where they can share ideas and find other educators. We launched that in the US and in Europe in English. And so that for the first several years, we did this platform just in English and it evolved and changed. It is still evolving and changing and will need to, which is great. But we launched it in Japan and Japanese, and it was so interesting to see what really mattered to educators and how they learned best, 
who they saw as um, particularly valuable or esteemed, they tended to really want to hear from experts. And so hearing from a practitioner was interesting, but had less weight or less value. There was less interest in volunteering and sharing ideas. And that's cultural as well. I think one of the things I learned about the Japanese educational system is the power of the professional development that happens in schools where they're learning communities that work very closely together over long periods of time and build up tremendous trust. We don't have a model like that in the United States broadly. And I think there's tremendous value in thinking about learning that way. It made it, it made a lot more sense as I looked at the learning community we had created that we hadn't created it with those same values or with the same understanding in mind. And so the things that were most successful for us was when we were bringing experts to these educators because they already had a community that was helping them learn and grow. So that's an example. There are countless things that I've learned from this, but it's been wonderful to have an opportunity to just get insight. Uh, it makes me question how we do things as well. What would you say is some of the best career advice you've been given? One of the things that I think I learned as a professional was how to how to make a mistake. So everybody's going to make mistakes. That's part of the nature of it. The, the issue isn't did you make a mistake? It's how do you recover from it? And I learned early from one of my managers who was just fabulous to come with the come quickly and say, OK, something's gone wrong and to come with a solution to say, here's what I think we can do next and to learn from it so that I didn't repeat the same mistake again. And I think that that's something that as I've moved on in my career and gotten more comfortable in my role, I don't always take the same risks. I'm not always on that kind of burning edge of learning where you do make more mistakes. And that's such an important place to continue to be. And I just have to work harder to look for opportunities to continue to learn and challenge myself to stay in a place where I can keep learning and can keep better, getting better at achieving the broad goals. The broad goals may not change as much, but how we get there should continue to change and evolve. So would you give similar advice to somebody um, who is just starting out in the workforce and to somebody who's been in the workforce for a while? How would that change? I mean, yeah, I mean, I think in the beginning, sometimes it's it's the fear is different. That the fear of making a mistake is that oh, I'm just starting and people don't know me. I haven't shown what I know I can do yet. And when you're further along in your career, the fear may be, but I know this works, and so I'm not going to take another risk. Both of those are really dangerous places to stay. And so I think the importance of when you're just getting started and you're new in a field that you need to bring new ideas. And that's part of the gift that you bring to the organization is you're going to ask the questions that people have stopped asking. And maybe they shouldn't have stopped asking those questions or the timing is different and those questions will be heard differently. And I think when you're further along in your career, it's even more important to question. We've always done it this way, but is it the way we want to do it tomorrow? Do we want to continue to with some of the same patterns? They may have worked for us in the past. Hopefully many of them worked for us in the past, but what's different? What are the things that we want to change and to not be afraid to try new things? I think about the example of Kodak and that they invented the first digital camera, but weren't able to really keep going in that direction. And what a shame, an incredible organization. Um, but I would love to, I want to stay on the edge of learning, on the edge of continuing to try new things. Well, Tacey, this was, this was great. Thank you for all the insight you provided. And it was great to have you as a guest today. My pleasure. I really enjoyed it. And thank you so much for the work you do. I love learning from the other folks that you've interviewed. Thank you. And we'll see you next time on Sarder TV.